I'm not under oath. Hey, welcome to a new video. Most of the time, criminals end up deeply regretting their actions. But sometimes, when criminals get caught, they show no remorse. Today, we'll be breaking down the most infamous and shocking cases of truly ruthless convicts who showed no remorse in court. And I am not sorry for the things I did do. Are you new to this channel? Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And before we start, like the video. Twenty, William George Davis. Between 2017 and 2018, William George worked as a nurse at Christus Trinity Mother Francis Hospital in Texas, specifically in the recovery room of the operating department. His presence raised suspicions among doctors as a series of patients fell unexpectedly ill following heart surgeries. In a disturbing pattern, each of these patients passed away after William had been the last medical professional to interact with them. Adding to the suspicion, security footage implicated William in each case, capturing him in the patient's rooms just before their deaths. Security camera video shows Davis enter the victim's room. Just three minutes later, the patient's heart alarm went off. Subsequent autopsies revealed a troubling commonality, air in the victim's brains, indicating that William had injected air into their bodies post-surgery. Troublingly, he even confessed to his former spouse over the phone that he had devised a method to keep patients unwell to prolong his overtime earnings. Flushed the line and the blood cleared out and everything. After that, everything looked good. I walked out of the room and that was all I did. Christopher Greenway, Joseph Colina, Ronald Clark, and John Lafferty were the victims of William's sinister actions. Following his arrest, he faced trial and was subsequently convicted of the murders. Remarkably, when William received his death sentence, he remained untouched. William Davis has been sentenced to death. He was convicted of... However, a display of emotion surfaced during the court proceedings when a family member of one of the victims addressed him. Presently, William is confined to death row, where he continues to maintain his innocence. I don't think he did it. I don't think the evidence shows that he did it asserting that his intentions were never to inflict harm upon his patients. The jury took a mere two hours to reach their verdict in this chilling case. 19. Jesse Pomeroy In the context of American history, few convicts remain as perplexing as Jesse Pomeroy. His first known acts of aggression unfolded during the years 1871 to 1872, when he was merely 11 to 12 years old. During this time, his neighborhood was plagued by a series of violent attacks on young children. These assaults were characterized by their extreme brutality. A change of residence did little to halt his disturbing behavior as the attacks persisted in his new surroundings, eventually leading to his apprehension. Due to his age, Jesse was committed to a facility for troubled youth. He spent a period of time there before being allowed to return to his mother at the age of 14. Yet, this was just the beginning of his unsettling saga. Upon his release, Jesse reverted to his sinister tendencies, but with an even more chilling twist. Reports emerged of missing children, and grimly, their remains were discovered in locations including the basement of his mother's dress shop. Subsequent to his re-arrest, Jesse faced trial, and both the judge and the prosecutor were unwavering in their determination to ensure he never tasted freedom again. As a result, he was sentenced to lifelong incarceration. While incarcerated, Jesse exhibited not only a remorseless demeanor, but also incredible intelligence. Accounts suggest he self-taught foreign languages out of sheer boredom and even made several escape attempts. These endeavors, however, were unsuccessful. Jesse's life ended behind bars, his demise attributed to a heart attack. 18. Sherry Papini The Sherry Papini case was one of the most sensational and controversial stories of 2016. Sherry went for a run one day and never came home. The California woman disappeared. History surrounding the disappearance of that California mom, another young woman, and then claimed she was kidnapped and tortured by two Hispanic women for 22 days before being released on Thanksgiving Day. Her story sparked a massive manhunt, a media frenzy, and a wave of sympathy from the public. However, Four years later, Sherry admitted that she had faked her own abduction to spend time with her ex-boyfriend. A Northern California mother who claimed she had been kidnapped, confronted with the proof that she made the whole thing up. Who was also involved in the hoax. She pleaded guilty to mail fraud, 
and making false statements to the FBI. Papini now expected to plead guilty to one count of making false statements to federal agents and one count of mail fraud. And was sentenced to 18 months in prison. Then last fall, a judge sentenced Papini to 18 months in prison. She also had to pay back more than $300,000 that she had received from various sources, including a GoFundMe campaign and a victim compensation fund. Sherry's hoax was exposed by advances in DNA technology, which linked her clothing to her ex-boyfriend. He confessed that they had planned the scheme together and that she had lied about her injuries and her captures. Sherry's husband, who had reported her missing and defended her story, said she felt betrayed and humiliated by his wife's actions. This case raised questions about the role of race, gender, and media in shaping public perception and reaction. Some critics accused Sherry of exploiting stereotypes and fears about Hispanic women, while others argued that she was a victim of mental illness or domestic abuse. Some supporters maintained that Papini was telling the truth or that she deserved forgiveness and compassion. The general consensus now is that she was absolutely lying, which is also supported by the evidence. It is also important to note that, in the aftermath of this case, the Hispanic community at large reportedly faced a string of backlash before the truth came out, and many individuals lived in fear for a short time, apprehensive of racist acts of vigilantism. Sherry was ruthlessly remorseless during most of this case, right up until sentencing. She held on to her story until she couldn't anymore. Her actions during police interviews can only be described as theatrical. When she was backed into a corner at sentencing, she was forced to finally take accountability, which led to some tears in the courtroom. She was sentenced to 18 months behind bars, followed by 36 months of probation. 17. John and Samantha Allen in July 2011, authorities received a distressing report of a young girl's untimely demise in Phoenix. The focus of their investigation led them to the residence of Judith Deal, Cynthia Stoltzman, Samantha Allen, and John Allen. Samantha and John were a married couple, while Cynthia was Samantha's mother and Judith the homeowner. The unfortunate victim, Aim, was Judith's granddaughter. Her lifeless body was discovered within a small trunk, her death attributed to suffocation. It was revealed that Samantha and John who were Ames cousins, were responsible for subjecting her to a cruel punishment. Allegedly, the young girl was forced to endure physically demanding activities, such as back bends and yard laps, before being confined to the trunk. Initially, they attempted to pass off their actions as a result of a hide-and-seek game, asserting that Aim had entered the trunk voluntarily. However, this explanation was swiftly debunked as the trunk's dimensions made it implausible for her to have shut it from within. The evidence indicated that she had been forcefully placed inside. The catalyst for this horrifying ordeal? Aim's transgression of taking a popsicle without permission. Disturbingly, Aim had suffered from a chronic neglect and malnourishment throughout her life. As the investigation unfolded, an increasingly distressing pattern of abuse and disregard emerged. Other adults residing in the household faced legal repercussions for their complicity in the tragic events. Both Samantha and John were sentenced to death. John's reaction was visibly emotional as he broke down in tears within the courtroom. John Allen's family in the front row watching him burst into tears, learning he's going to be put to death. Conveying a semblance of genuine remorse. In stark contrast, Samantha steadfastly maintained that their actions were driven by familial loyalty, advocating for a lesser punishment due to John's more direct role in placing AIM in the trunk. 16. Stephen Griffiths From 2009 to 2019, a disturbing series of events unfolded as Stephen Griffiths claimed the lives of multiple workers from the adult industry in Yorkshire, England. His formative years were marked by a fascination with notorious mass murderers, a passion that he extended to his academic pursuits by studying criminology and even authoring his PhD on the subject. Tragically, his perverse fantasies eventually escalated into heinous actions carried out with a chilling and unique choice of weapon, a crossbow. It's a powerful crossbow right after a murder, taunting the CCTV camera. Each of his victims fell prey to this macabre instrument. In a twisted parallel to Gary Ridgway, Stephen believed that he was purging his community of its perceived ills by targeting prostitutes. Upon his eventual apprehension, investigators delving into his personal domain uncovered a collection of books detailing the dismemberment of human bodies. During his trial, Stephen exhibited an unsettling absence of remorse for his atrocities. Quite the contrary, he displayed an unsettling degree of pride and even bestowed upon himself the moniker the crossbow cannibal within the confines of the courtroom. Strikingly, he made little effort to mount a defense, entering a guilty plea 
that led to a relatively swift trial process. 15. Christy Alcazar The Christy Alcazar case is a shocking and tragic example of a mother who allegedly killed her own infant daughter. Crime, a South Jersey mother confessed to stabbing her five-month-old daughter in their home. According to court documents, Christy confessed to the crime and said she did it to fulfill the last of her sins, murder. She also reportedly showed no remorse and stated that she would not change any of the events surrounding the murder. Christy was arrested on December 3, 2021, after police responded to an open 911 call with an audible disturbance in the background. Investigators say they found her arguing with another person in an upstairs apartment on Helms Cove Lane in Penns Grove, New Jersey, where the body of her five-month-old daughter lay nearby with visible stab wounds. Police also recovered multiple knives and other evidence from the scene. The motive for the killing is unclear, but some neighbors speculated that Christy may have suffered from postpartum depression or psychosis. The father of the child was not present at the time of the tragedy. Authorities say the father of the baby was not home at the time of the incident. Christy has two other children, who are now in the custody of Child Protective Services. She appeared in court on December 6, 2021, and was charged with two counts of murder and one count of possession of a weapon. She is being held at the Salem County Correctional Facility, pending a detention hearing. 14. Dennis Rader The Dennis Rader case is one of the most notorious serial killer cases in American history. Dennis, who called himself BTK, Blind Torture Kill, murdered 10 people in Cedric County, Kansas between 1974 and 1991. He eluded capture for more than three decades until he resumed communication with the police and the media in 2004, leading to his arrest in 2005. One of the most shocking aspects of the case was how Dennis acted in court during his trial. He showed no remorse or emotion as he calmly described the gruesome details of his crimes, often using technical terms and acronyms. Stalking stage is when you start learning more about your victims, potential victims. He seemed to enjoy reliving his killings and displaying his intelligence and cunning. He also tried to justify his actions by blaming his victims, his childhood, or his inner demons. Many observers and experts were appalled by Dennis's lack of empathy and humanity. They speculated that he suffered from a severe personality disorder, such as narcissism or psychopathy. Some also suggested that he was trying to manipulate the court and the public by portraying himself as a rational and cooperative defendant. However, his cold and arrogant demeanor did not win him any sympathy or leniency. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole for each of his 10 murders. 13. Michael Brady In October 2017, a calculated plan was set in motion by Michael Brady and fellow inmates at North Carolina's Pascotank Correctional Institute with the intention to escape their confines. Michael, serving as the resolute leader, united the men in their determination to break free at any cost. Almost precisely two years later, Michael faced the jury once again, this time to answer for the tragic consequences that unfolded during this ill-fated prison escape endeavor. The lives of two correctional officers, Wendy Shannon and Justin Smith, as well as prison employees Veronica Darden and Jeffrey Howe, were lost in the course of this attempted breakout. The district attorney involved in this case conveyed to Michael Brady, they were not human beings. They were not mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, or sons and daughters. I stabbed him like four to eight times. I hit Jeffrey Howe until he stopped moving. They were just obstacles standing between him and his quest for freedom. They were barriers to be overcome. Michael employed a hammer's claw and as his weapon of choice in these fatal attacks. His defense sought to link his actions to past childhood abuse. However, it is essential to recognize that a significant number of individuals have faced childhood trauma without resorting to harmful behaviors. This narrative must not create a presumption of danger around survivors of such experiences. Michael's actions are a reflection of his own choices and character, unrelated to his history of abuse. The jury's swift return of a death penalty verdict seemed to echo a similar sentiment. Throughout the trial and sentencing, Michael exhibited an almost indifferent demeanor, projecting a sense of calm calculation. 12. Lowell Lee Andrews On November 28, 1958, Lowell Lee Andrews was found guilty of the brutal murders of his parents and sister. His sentence was carried out on November 30, 1962, through execution by hanging. Andrews, a zoology major who played the bassoon in college band, 
concealed disturbing inner thoughts beneath his seemingly ordinary facade. He nurtured elaborate fantasies involving the poisoning of his family, envisioning a future as a notorious gangster and hired assassin in Chicago, Illinois. During the Thanksgiving holiday of 1958, Andrews and his sister Jenny Marie both returned home. As his parents enjoyed television downstairs, Andrew immersed himself in reading the brothers Karamazov upstairs. Soon after, he meticulously groomed himself, donned a suit, and ascended the stairs, carrying a 22 caliber rifle and a revolver. Upon entering the room where his parents and sister resided, Andrews illuminated the space and immediately opened fire with his rifle. The initial shot fatally wounded his sister, followed by a barrage of bullets aimed at his parents. Despite their injuries, his mother and father each faced additional gunshots. His father, attempting to reach the kitchen, was subjected to a relentless series of 17 revolver shots. This horrifying sequence of events paints a chilling picture of Andrew's calculated and brutal actions that led to his execution. 11. Gary Hilton Meet Gary Hilton, a 76-year-old man whose sinister acts have earned him the chilling nickname of the National Forest Serial Killer. He is now behind bars for life, ensuring he will never see the outside world again. With four confirmed victims and a trail of suspected ones, Hilton has left a dark memory of terror in his wake. Among his confirmed victims were John and Irene Bryant, an elderly couple aged 84 and 80, who vanished during a trip to Pisgah National Forest. A widespread search eventually led to the discovery of Irene's moraines, followed by fragments of John's body. Disturbingly, surveillance footage captured Hilton using John's debit card at an ATM. In the brutal killings of John and Irene Bryant nearly six years ago, Cheryl Dunlap, a 46-year-old nurse from Florida State University, met a similarly tragic fate. After her disappearance, only fragmented remains were recovered, and once again, Hilton was tied to the case through ATM activity. Images from an ATM camera were released of a masked man using Dunlap's debit card in the days following her death. The pattern became evident, pointing to a possible serial killer in their midst. Then came the encounter with Meredith Emerson, who was out hiking with her dog. Witnesses reported seeing Hilton trailing her, which prompted police intervention. After thorough interrogation and subsequent arrest, Hilton faced the prospect of the death penalty. Convicted serial killer Gary Hilton was sentenced in Asheville Federal Court today for the murders of John and Irene Bryant. It was during this critical juncture that he agreed to lead authorities to Meredith's remains, bargaining for his own life to be spared. 10. Antoinette Frank Antoinette Frank remains the only woman residing on Louisiana's death row, a former police officer in New Orleans. Her life took a dark turn in 1995, when she committed a crime that would seal her fate with a death sentence. The circumstances that led to her policing career are as troubling as her subsequent actions. Despite a lifelong history of evident mental health struggles and two failed psychiatric screenings during her pursuit of the job, Antoinette managed to join the police force. The police department's desperation to retain officers during a turbulent period in the 1990s seemed to override sound judgment. A psychiatrist's recommendation against hiring her went unheeded. Antoinette's tenure proved less than commendable, marked by indecisiveness, confusion, shyness, and irrational behavior. She was constantly reprimanded, a precursor to the tragic events that would follow. In a fateful turn of events in March 1995, Antoinette and her boyfriend, entangled in illicit activities, visited a Vietnamese restaurant, their third visit that night. Their intentions became horrifyingly clear to the owner, who belatedly recognized the threat. Having secretly kept a key from a previous visit, Antoinette and her partner entered the establishment, opening fire indiscriminately. Their brutal assault claimed the lives of two restaurant employees and a security guard, who happened to be a fellow officer, compounding the tragedy. Antoinette was swiftly sentenced to death. Subsequent legal efforts have been centered on appeals, primarily arguing her mental state at the time of the crime. Though she acknowledged her role in the crime, her response to the sentencing was marked by a vehement denial of other suspected offenses. 9. Joseph Paul Franklin Joseph Paul Franklin was an American serial killer and white supremacist who gained notoriety for his racially motivated killing spree during the late 1970s and early 1980s. Born James Clayton Vaughn Jr. on April 13, 1950, in Mobile, Alabama, he would later change his name to Joseph Paul Franklin as part of his white supremacist beliefs. Franklin's crimes were characterized by a disturbing mix of racial hatred and personal grievances. He targeted African Americans and interracial couples, believing that he was waging a war against what he perceived as a corrupt and degenerate society. 
His actions were heavily influenced by his affiliation with various white supremacist and neo-Nazi groups, which fueled his extremist views. Franklin's killing spree began in 1977 and spanned several states, including Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana, and Tennessee. His choice of victims was chillingly random, often selecting individuals solely based on their race or relationships. His MO typically involved shooting his victims from a distance and then escaping the scene before law enforcement could respond. One of his most infamous acts occurred on June 8, 1978, when he targeted Hustler magazine publisher Larry Flint. Franklin shot Flint outside a Georgia courthouse. Flint moments earlier, he had been shot once in the stomach. Leaving him paralyzed from the waist down, Flint survived the attack, but the incident marked one of the most high-profile instances of Franklin's violence. In addition to his racially motivated crimes, Franklin also attempted to assassinate civil rights activist Vernon Jordan Jr. and murdered several others, including interracial couples and innocent bystanders. His crimes sparked fear and outrage within the communities he terrorized, and law enforcement agencies launched a nationwide manhunt to capture him. Franklin's reign of terror eventually came to an end in 1980 when he was arrested in Florida. He was later convicted and sentenced to death for several of his murders. However, his time on death row was marked by legal challenges and appeals. Franklin's own volatile behavior and shifting ideologies further complicated his case. In 1997, Franklin confessed to the murder of an interracial couple in Utah and was sentenced to death once again. He was ultimately executed by lethal injection on November 20th, 2013 in Missouri. His case highlighted the complex issues surrounding hate crimes, domestic terrorism, and the lingering influence of white supremacist ideologies in the United States. 8. Willie Corey Godbolt In the case of Willie Corey Godbolt from Mississippi, who became unhinged and resorted to violence, the result was a devastating crime spree that claimed eight lives. Back in 2017, Godbolt launched a series of attacks targeting his wife's family, systematically moving from one house to another along the street. Tragically, among his victims was a sheriff's deputy. Fortunately, Godbolt's wife managed to escape with their children. A cousin of Godbolt later revealed that he had exhibited troubling episodes and had been displaying increasingly erratic behavior leading up to the violent outburst. Throughout the courtroom proceedings, Godbolt consistently created disruptions. His convoluted reasoning regarding the events disturbed everyone present. At one juncture, he attempted to argue that he had been left with no alternative but to open fire on the sheriff's deputy due to the deputy's unexpected arrival at the house. He subsequently acknowledged that his ultimate intention had been to provoke law enforcement into using deadly force against him. Godbolt's demeanor in court is deeply unsettling. Despite offering apologies to the victim's families, an unsettling smirk was perceptible on his face. Remarkably, he exhibited no reaction when his sentence was pronounced. 7. Len Davis Like Antoinette Frank, Len Davis was once a member of the New Orleans police force. Despite mounting evidence of his corruption, the department chose to retain him, a decision echoing Antoinette's case. However, as it became evident that Davis was willing to resort to murder to conceal his abusive conduct as an officer, he was apprehended and subsequently sentenced to death. During his brief tenure as a police officer, spanning from 1987 to 1992, Davis accumulated 20 complaints and faced six suspensions. In 1994, a local New Orleans resident witnessed him brutally assault a young man mistakenly believed to be a suspect. The observer, Kim Groves, reported the incident to the New Orleans police. Upon learning of her report, Davis orchestrated a sinister plan to eliminate her. In 1996, Davis was found guilty of his crimes. Although he did not personally take Groves' life, he commanded someone else to carry out the act and took pains to conceal the evidence. Consequently, he was sentenced to death. Davis' legal counsel contends that, while the verdict did not surprise him, it did deeply disturb him. Subsequently, the verdict was altered, albeit nominally when it was discovered that Davis had an intellectual disorder. Executing an individual with any form of intellectual disability is illegal. As a result, Davis now serves a life sentence. 6. James Fairweather James Fairweather gained notoriety for his chilling crimes committed in the United Kingdom. Born on October 23, 1998, James embarked on a violent spree that terrorized his community. James's criminal journey began in 2014 when, at the age of 15, he embarked on a spree of violence in the town of Colchester, Essex. 
His first victim was James Atfield, a vulnerable man suffering from brain injuries, whom James brutally attacked and killed on March 29, 2014. Just over two months later, on June 2nd, he murdered Nahid Almania, a student who was stabbed while walking near a home. Both victims were targeted at random and suffered horrific, unprovoked attacks. As authorities launched an investigation into these gruesome murders, James's behavior drew attention. He was known to exhibit disturbing traits, such as posting ominous messages on social media and having a fascination with serial killers. These factors, combined with forensic evidence and witness testimonies, eventually led to his arrest on May 28, 2015. When James stood trial for his crimes, his actions and demeanor further underscored his disturbing nature. He displayed a callous and detached attitude, seemingly devoid of remorse for the lives he had taken. During the trial, evidence presented by the prosecution painted a grim picture of his cold-blooded actions, leaving little doubt about his guilt. James's defense attempted to argue that he suffered from mental health issues, including psychopathy, which affected his ability to fully comprehend the consequences of his actions. However, this defense was largely dismissed, and the jury found him guilty on both counts of murder. On December 17, 2015, James Fairweather was sentenced to a minimum of 27 years in prison for his heinous crimes. The judge described his actions as chilling and evil, emphasizing the need to protect society from individuals like him. 5. Michael Elijah Adams Michael Adams, also known by the moniker Dirty Mike, exemplifies the unsettling convergence of a troubled individual and a harsh upbringing, resulting in a cascade of calamity. His tale is one born of adversity, intertwined with a nefarious environment. From an early age, the seeds of malevolence took root within him. Dirty Mike embarked on his foray into criminality at the tender age of 14, seeking an escape from the clutches of his abusive household, preferring the rails as his mode of transport. He delved into a world of train hopping and illicit dealings. In those early days, he recollects a sense of carefree abandon. However, this innocence swiftly transformed into aggression as he engaged in confrontations with fellow drifters. Tragically, his path turned even darker as he laid claim to the lives of some of these vulnerable individuals. The precise tally of his victims remains a subject of heated debate, yet Michael himself admits to having extinguished anywhere between 16 to 30 lives. Upon his eventual apprehension, Michael brazenly divulged the chilling details of his actions to law enforcement. Interrogations unraveled a disturbing chronicle of his deeds. He openly acknowledged his involvement in attacks against the homeless, often yielding to inquiries from authorities seeking clarification on specific cases. Remarkably, he even etched a macabre record of his alleged victims onto his skin, each tattoo representing another life extinguished. His rationales for his heinous acts were equally unsettling. He cited his inability to relate to certain individuals or their lifestyles as motivation for their demise. At times, he claimed that clashes arose due to their refusal to display the colors of his affiliated gang. Throughout the trial proceedings, Michael's demeanor served as a haunting testament to his callousness. Displaying an air of smug indifference, he often wore an unsettling smile within the courtroom's confines. Public appearances further underscored his lack of remorse as he unabashedly shared his anticipation for his upcoming incarceration. Astonishingly, he asserted that he had secured preferential treatment through undisclosed agreements with the police, even dubbing his impending prison stint a form of retirement. 4. Lucky Ward Between the years spanning approximately 1985 to 2010, the city of Houston, Texas cast a chilling shadow over its residents. Amidst this backdrop of fear, a relentless serial killer known as Lucky Ward lurked targeting those he deemed vulnerable, transgender women, the homeless, and others on the fringes of society. Lucky's path was marred by misfortune from his formative years. The specter of abuse haunted his childhood home, a harrowing experience that eventually paved the way for the emergence of schizoaffective disorder within him. Distinguishing itself from schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder encapsulates severe mood instability and cognitive impairment. Diagnosis necessitates the coexistence of schizophrenia and a mood disorder, such as bipolar disorder, bestowing upon its sufferers a profound and enduring impact. Upon his eventual apprehension, Lucky confessed to the brutal slayings of two victims. However, the chilling question of motive lingered as he remained unable to provide a coherent explanation for his heinous acts. Legal complexities intertwined with the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey conspired to delay Lucky's trial for several years. When the moment of reckoning finally arrived, Lucky Ward faced a courtroom charged with two counts of murder. The verdict was swift and unrelenting, a sentence of death. 
yet he displayed no reaction to the news. 3. Richard Beasley In the year 2011, Ohio bore witness to a series of heinous acts that would forever brand Richard Beasley as the Craigslist killer. His sinister deeds claimed the lives of three men, Timothy Kern, David Foley, and Ralph Geiger. The moniker Craigslist Killer emerged from the chilling manner in which he ensnared his victims, using the nefarious online platform to orchestrate his malevolent plans. His trap was set with a cunningly deceptive ad, promising a seemingly innocuous caretaker role for the sprawling 688-acre farm, complete with a two-bedroom trailer and a weekly stipend of $300. The advertisement insidiously urged someone older and single preferred. The pivotal moment of Richard's downfall transpired when he opened fire on one of the respondents to his deceptive ad. Scott Davis narrowly escaped the lethal intent of Richard's shot, his elbow bearing the brunt of the assault. Swift action on Scott's part led authorities to the scene, unearthing not only a grave dug in the earth, but also the lifeless bodies of two victims, Ralph Geiger and David Pauley. A grim pattern emerged as investigations unveiled the heart-wrenching fate that had befallen Timothy Kern, who too met his end from firearm wounds to the head. Throughout the ensuing legal proceedings, Richard steadfastly clung to a fervent denial of his involvement in these brutal killings. No, I, had, I did not. His defense attorney, James Burden, echoed the refrain of innocence, citing a reported lack of evidence. Yet, the prosecution skillfully wove a compelling narrative that erased any shadows of doubt. The unraveling truth revealed Richard's use of Ralph Geiger's identity to rent lodgings from a local woman, a detail that further implicated him in the nefarious web he had woven. Even as the weighty gavel of justice resounded with a verdict, Richard Beasley continued to maintain his facade of innocence. 2. Otis McCain In the chilling annals of November 2016, Detective Marconi's fate was irrevocably sealed while he performed the mundane task of writing a ticket from the confines of his patrol car. The abrupt arrival of Otis McCain on the scene would herald an unthinkable act of violence. With calculated determination, Otis emerged from his vehicle brandishing a firearm and unleashed a barrage of fatal shots upon the unsuspecting detective. After the unsettling event, a sense of odd confusion lingered as Otis embarked on a perplexing journey. Rather than evading the law enforcement response triggered by his malevolent deed, Otis ventured to a local courthouse to seal a marriage bond. This out-of-place act occurred while a citywide search was underway, creating a strange contrast that highlights the unusual aspect of the situation. In a perplexing twist, his legal team sought to challenge the charge of taking the life of an on-duty officer by asserting that Detective Marconi was not engaged in official duties at the precise moment of the attack. This feeble attempt to clear his name crumbled under the weight of overwhelming evidence and Otis's own confessions, which reverberated throughout the interrogation room and upon his apprehension. This case remains chilling in the worst ways, as Otis has never given a motive and showed no remorse. 1. Scott Nelson in a pivotal legal saga, Scott Nelson, aged 55, found himself embroiled in a series of grievous crimes. His conviction encompassed charges of first-degree murder, kidnapping, carjacking, and robbery. This marked a significant juncture, concluding in a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Prosecutors wove a chilling tale of events that transpired in September 2017. Nelson forcibly entered a Winter Park home, subjecting Jennifer Lynn Fulford, 56, to a harrowing ordeal, restraining her and confining her within the trunk of her own vehicle, he proceeded to extract $300 from her bank account via an ATM. Throughout the trial, Nelson's behavior exhibited moments of tumult, manifesting in courtroom disruptions that punctuated the proceedings. During the trial's penalty phase, testimony unveiled his problematic interactions with Muslim inmates during this prison stint. In a burst of protest, he vehemently asserted, I'm not a racist, prompting a courtroom intervention. Similar instances recurred including during his brother's testimony, wherein Nelson's objections drew reprimands from the judge. Nelson's unanticipated testimony brought him face to face with the jury. In a startling plea, he implored them to deliver the harshest sentence, death. I am a homicidal maniac, he declared, seeking a direct confrontation with his impending judgment. His defense aimed to evoke empathy, detailing a life marked by childhood abuse, extended incarcerations spanning 25 years, and the shadow of head injuries. Despite these efforts, the final verdict decreed a life imprisonment, emphasizing the gravity of his deeds and their indelible repercussions. Well, that's all we have for today. If you liked today's video, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel. Be sure to check out our page and watch more videos as well. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.